they put on the program pioneered the whole area of not only satellite reconnaissance, really, but the useful application of space. Any failure that occurred in space, other than the Challenger blow-up, we did first. When I look at what, what we did on Corona, it looks pretty good. But uh, when you put it out in today's light, it looks pretty, pretty amateurish. But the whole country was amateurish. This is the American space program that you know. Mercury, Gemini, Apollo. The familiar names of the pioneering efforts that eventually put men on the moon. But there was another space program you weren't told about. It was called Corona and it was the world's first spy satellite. From 1960 to 1972, Corona took pictures that laid bare the secrets of the communist world. Born in the era of vacuum tubes and computer punch cards, Corona was a landmark accomplishment in engineering and espionage. But success did not come easily, and it would not have come at all but for the stubborn conviction of the men who built the satellite. They were from the generation stunned by Pearl Harbor and toughened by World War II, the generation that created the atomic bomb and then quickly learned to fear its power. Corona's story begins in 1946, a year after the bombing of Hiroshima. Under the code name Operation Crossroads, an elite group of scientists and soldiers gathered in the Bikini Islands to test America's atomic superweapon. Scrapped warships would be the targets of the world's first underwater nuclear blast. To record the devastation, the military sent in a dozen RB-29s filled with cameras and reconnaissance experts. Several men who later played key roles in Corona were on these planes. Camera designer Walter Levison was one of them. Levison spent most of World War II photographing enemy targets for bombing runs. He was not certain what to expect at Bikini. I can't remember how many planes there were, but there were a lot of them, maybe 10, 12, something like that. And the whole side of the airplane was full of cameras. And we were warned, you know, there's X number of seconds to detonation. And we had on very, very dark glasses. And we were not supposed to look directly at the bomb anyway. But what the hell was the point of being there if you weren't going to be looking at the bomb? So there's this beautiful, bright flash of light, you know, and then the cloud starts growing. And it's a fireball. And it's immense. It's far bigger than you would think it would be. The ships that were anchored there were just tossed up in the air, you know, and those are big, big ships. And uh, they were tossed around like they were toys. And um, I think a whole bunch of us at that point turned their attention away from weapons of war, more toward how do you prevent a war, and what can you do. And that became the focus for the rest of my life, actually. The threat of a third world war emerged almost immediately after the second came to an end. Two nations had emerged as superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Their ideological differences were vast, and the political rhetoric between the two grew openly hostile. 
The Soviets made no secret that their goal was to liberate the world through communist revolution. Western leaders worried that the Soviets would develop nuclear weapons of their own and launch them against Europe and the U.S. in a massive surprise attack. The problem was no one knew what the Soviets were doing. The nation was vast and mysterious, a brutal police state that punished those who asked too many questions. The exact size and strength of the Soviet military was known to few outside Stalin's inner circle. Conventional spying was useless. Aerial reconnaissance looked promising, but no traditional airplane could stay out of range of Soviet fighters and anti-aircraft guns. Forward thinkers realized the ideal vantage point for spying was outer space. Before World War II, the idea of even breaking out of the Earth's atmosphere was laughable. But Nazi Germany's V-2s proved that rockets were deadly serious business. Space was now within our reach. As early as 1946, Army scientists tested captured V-2s at White Sands, New Mexico. At the same time, the Air Force asked the RAND Corporation, a high-technology think tank, to study the feasibility of putting cameras into Earth orbit. But at this point, breaking the bounds of Earth's gravity still seemed a long way from reality. Working from other RAND studies, the Air Force turned to a much older form of transportation. Balloons had first been used for aerial reconnaissance during the Civil War. Now the U.S. hoped to turn them loose against the Soviets. In the early 1950s, the Air Force began converting its weather balloons, seen here, into high-flying reconnaissance platforms laden with cameras and listening devices. Eventually, hundreds of recon balloons were launched into the jet stream. Light-sensitive photoelectric cells triggered the cameras on at dawn and off at dusk. Codenamed Gopher and Genetrix, the balloons resulted in little solid intelligence, mostly because they could not be guided over specific targets. Test balloons also had the unfortunate side effect of fueling the nationwide hysteria over UFOs. Only 44 payloads were recovered from the 516 Genetrix balloons launched, and just 32 had usable photography. Still, one balloon uncovered a large nuclear refining facility in Siberia, so the program was considered a modest success. Genetrix's most influential supporter was Dr. Edwin Land, the inventor of the Polaroid camera and a fierce patriot. Land began secretly advising the White House on reconnaissance issues in 1954. Over the next three decades, Land and a small team of experts provided behind-the-scenes guidance on a slew of classified projects. That advice was urgently needed. The USSR had recently detonated its first hydrogen bomb. Eisenhower's fears of a nuclear sneak attack grew. He demanded information, but it had to be obtained as discreetly as possible. Land and his team suggested a short-term solution, building a controversial Lockheed design called the U-2. The Air Force had commissioned the high-flying plane, but they later rejected it because it couldn't carry guns or bombs. Now the U-2 would be manufactured, and fitted with a powerful new camera and high-resolution film. But it would not be controlled by the Air Force. At that time, Eisenhower had two institutions whose mission was security. One, the Air Force and the CIA. Both of them were institutionally incapable of doing this job, the U-2. And, and I'll say the follow-on of the satellite. When I talk U-2, I'm talking overflight, U-2 satellite. When those two institutions, each of which alone was incapable of doing this, were brought together, we had two negatives make a positive. It created the U-2 and the follow-on reconnaissance satellite effort. The Air Force provided support, and uh, the CIA, which really wasn't in the hardware business at all, was carried the ball, and under Bissell did a fantastic job. 
Richard Bissell was the CIA's point man on the U-2. Bissell had been the hidden hand behind the Marshall Plan to rebuild post-war Europe. His dealings with the Soviets left him convinced that the West faced an implacable adversary that would lie, cheat, and kill to realize its goals. He was determined to fight back by using America's technological know-how in the service of spying. He had an unbelievable memory. He could recite train schedules from 10 years before. He did that just to keep his mind fit. He, uh, he was a patrician fellow, yeah, very well educated, a man of great goodwill. He had come into the agency in Alan Dulles's time, and his first real project had been to develop the U-2. And he clearly was one of those people that just had a lot of get up and go. He could cause people to work together, he could build a consensus, and he was decisive. Under Bissell's streamlined management, the U-2 was built and flown in nine months. In 1956, it began its dangerous treks into Soviet airspace. Much as they tried, the Soviets could not shoot down the high-flying plane, but they did lodge diplomatic protests after every incursion. For this reason, Eisenhower rarely approved flights into Russia. But the photos the U-2 did bring back hinted that Soviet boasts of military superiority were more wishful thinking than reality. U-2 photos turned up surprisingly small numbers of long-range bombers. Nuclear test sites were found, but the size of the bomb blasts showed that the weapons were not as powerful as Soviets claimed. Soviet rocketry was coming on strong, but the threat did not seem overwhelming. Intelligence officers wondered if the Soviets were hiding all their significant installations somewhere in the USSR's vast northern territories. The problem was that the U-2 was not designed to take pictures of wide areas of terrain. At this point, balloons rose again as a reconnaissance option, this time under the name Weapon System 461L. Built around a powerful camera designed by optical physicist Walter Levison, 461L was an order of magnitude improvement in photographic quality for aerial spying. The camera could take sharp photos of wide areas of terrain from altitudes near the edge of the Earth's atmosphere, twice as high as previous balloon cameras. In 1958, after months of delays, three 461L balloons were launched off an aircraft carrier into the jet stream. Unfortunately, the launches had been delayed, and someone forgot to reset the balloon's timers. All three payloads dropped into communist territory. Eisenhower was livid. The Air Force had guaranteed him that this new surveillance program would be undetectable. Now the president had an international incident on his hands. 461L was quickly canceled. But the elegance of Walter Levison's camera was noted by Polaroid's Dr. Land. It would quickly be put to new use. In October of 1957, the Soviet Union put the first man-made satellite into space. Soviet spokesmen pointedly noted that the same rockets that sent Sputnik into orbit could easily send missiles to any part of the world. Sputnik set off a near panic in the United States. Politicians charged that America was lagging behind Soviet technology, and if action wasn't taken soon, the West would fall victim to a missile gap. In fact, American missile building was in full swing. The Air Force's Ballistic Missile Division had been test-firing ICBMs for years. Unfortunately, throughout the 1950s, U.S. rockets seemed plagued by gremlins. One of the programs managed by the Ballistic Missile Division was Weapon System 117L, a semi-secret